part of what I do is I do healing ministry and I'll just say the word it's actually technically it's miracle ministry um, and there's lots of ways to define that and I'm not a I'm not a theologian in the sense of how do you define this but I'll say things happening recreative things happening or creative healing happening that goes beyond natural science or what natural science or natural medicine can do um, some things are healing things that medicine can do but the Lord just wants to show up to let people know that he is concerned about them and that he personally can do things so I do that um, I, do. I sometimes speak in different churches equipping them to do the works and to do the ministry that Jesus has left behind for us to do much of what he did so so part of what I do is I'll go around the churches but I'll also go to other nations and work with evangelists and work with folks who are and equip them and um, I want to be sensitive about that because because some of them are persecuted churches <clears throat> but um, to equip them to do that and what generally happens, and, and part of this also is a ministry of, of prophecy and getting revelation, not in the sense where here's a new scriptural text, which I know a lot of people would be really upset about. That's not what I'm talking about because the Logos is the Logos. But part of the ministry I do is like when you're, you're figuring out where to fish, you know, the principle, and I work with evangelists, is the principle is, is that. Peter was out fishing, and he was an expert fisherman, but he caught nothing. But the moment that Jesus came onto his boat and said, let's go out a little bit further, and said, set your nets over here, even though Peter must have thought, who is this guy, this carpenter, he knows nothing about fishing. But the moment he said, okay, Lord, because you asked me to, even though I've been out all night, I will do it. And that process, when you drop the nets in the water, and then suddenly the fish overflowed the nets. They had to bring in John and Andrew, um, John, sorry, and James, and they came in and their nets were overflowed to breaking. That process caused Peter to repent. It wasn't do something right or you've been in sin. That's the process of the of the miracle of of the Lord leading him there caused him to repent. And um, that is a little kind of like a model of sometimes how I work where the goal is even when it's not particularly just healing ministry but it's always usually involved is the goal is to figure out what the Holy Spirit is doing to be under the submission of the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to know what he's doing and where he's seeking people out and to join with him to receive in prayer what he wants you to do and to be obedient to do what he wants you to do and if we do that and especially if we work in teams when we do that because wherever two or more gather there I am when we do that that's part of the ministry I do is you end up having your nets overflow and it's a whole lot easier than you think it is so those are the <clears throat> those are the two the other ministry that I do is a number of churches I'll do prayer ministry not just praying for people but I'll pray and, and do what's called um you can look this up um, pray for prophetic words of knowledge and basically what that is is um, I'm praying and listening to and seeing what what Jesus, what the Holy Spirit, what the Father is doing in a congregation where he already knows all things. He's immutable. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He knows all things. But to, to be obedient to, to for him to say, this is what I'm doing, even though I don't naturally know that. And then I'll get a list <clears throat> together. A lot of times there'll be healing needs. Sometimes there'll be direct words for folks. That I don't know, always know who they are at all. Most of the time I don't. It's an act of faith. And I'll send them out to different pastors every Sunday morning. They'll ask me to do it. <clears throat> and then before ministry time, they'll read these things. And there's a very, very high level of accuracy. And what generally happens is when a word is given, and, and this is when Paul talks about this in Corinthians, why prophecy is so important. When a word is given and it, it's something directly for a person, they know that God is present, and then it, it, it unlocks keys in their hearts to surrender and to receive the love of God and repentance too. It, it started with just 
small groups. I used to go to a small group when I was here, when I when I was a student here at Asbury. There was a professor here who had a small group who operated in these things, but one of the, you know, it would just be in his basement, and we would just learn. He would teach us. He would go through and preach through the Word, very great, clear, like, preaching through the Word, and then we would to ministry time and there would be you know anywhere from 20 to 60 college students and other people and then if anyone had a need he would show us how to all gather around and pray for them and in that setting of a body in that setting of we're praying for somebody and and trying to practice what scripture said one will have a word one will have a song one will have a word you know Paul talks about this in that setting you start to learn to hear the Lord clearly because suddenly a thought comes across your mind um, that's not your own thought, but it's coming from within you because the Holy Spirit's living within you, <clears throat> as scripture says. And then you step on and say, I believe maybe the Lord is saying this. And then somebody else who's praying at the same time, laying hands, says, that's exactly what I was hearing. And when two or three people are doing that, what, that encourages you that, oh wait, this is how we test that the Lord is that the Lord operates in a body through prayer. And this was a lot of mercy praying like somebody has a condition, somebody needs direction, um, somebody's being persecuted, you know, whatever it is, somebody's going out into ministry. In that setting of, of groups praying for people is when I started to learn to actively be aware of the voice of the Lord. Um, it was not something I learned inside of my denominational churches that I grew up in. Um, and that's partly, <clears throat> I would say, that's partly because the early church didn't meet with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Most of the time they met in the homes, and the head of the home was kind of like the pastoral figure. And you'd meet in homes, and there was a lot more intimate care. <clears throat> and so things are possible within a home setting that sometimes are less possible within a 500-person or more church setting. There's a lot more intimacy and a lot more personal care that can happen. So that's when that started. Um, where it really started kicking up was, I think, a, a, you know, a few years ago, and I told this story in, in church the other day, where I just want to obey the word, and I also believe that whatever the Lord has said is true. This is really important, and I believe that He wants us to like, not test Him, but prove He's He's wanting to see what we'll do with His word. Like, will we steward His word? And so when I read things like Corinthians where it talks about the gifts of the Spirit, I came from a church growing up that didn't even believe that these things still ex like were still in operation after the apostles. It's what's called a cessationist theology. But yet I was experiencing them from the moment I was born again at 16. I had this hunger for this and things that they told me were not accessible were coming to me. And, you know, for instance, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, things like tongues. These were not in my church or were not like um, kosher in my church per se, but immediately I had such a dramatic born again experience that was visceral, that was, um, when you read church history, it was very experiential, that I recognized that there was a whole other kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, that was more real, more dominant than the physical kingdom that I lived on. And it was like my eyes were opened and I wanted more of him. And I recognize there's more of him. So I wouldn't read scriptures and say, well, this doesn't count anymore. I would read what Jesus said and what the scripture said, and, and I would say, show me this, Lord. I want to experience this because it's not off limits. Everything was like, taste and see that the Lord is good. Paul says, seek earnestly the gifts, you know, for the, and basically it's for the building up of the body, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so I would just seek these things out and then, I would test them because I didn't know I was 16. I was young when I first was, you know, born again and then a few months later filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's a little bit different. Um, but the outcomes of that are what really convinced me is that immediately after that experience, that baptism of the Holy Spirit experience when I was 16, my response was I started evangelizing my school. I couldn't not speak about the Lord. Um, I evangelized everywhere. You know, I do street ministry at 16 and things would start to happen. I would start to see connections in Scripture, um, not being in the world, but not of it, having this influence amongst my friends. I did some ministry when I was in Ireland for a number of months. I was on staff of a 
ministry organization and I would host teams, Christian college teams from America. And I remember, <clears throat> this is one thing I remember, when I was put into situations that were difficult or challenging, the Lord would reveal himself. For instance, I'd never done door-to-door -door street ministry. You know, the only time I'd seen that was like Jehovah's Witness from Mormons come to the door. But this was my first experience. I said, okay, they said, okay, you're gonna go and you're gonna go and knock on doors and pray for people. This was in North, County Down in Northern Ireland. And um, <clears throat> this was my first experience. I went and it was, a, you know, I was 21, um, a junior here at Asbury. And then a lady let us in. She was probably in her 30s. And she says, she says, would you like some tea? Come on in. And we just said, we were just here to pray and just like telling you. And then all of a sudden this lady starts weeping <laughs> as she's saying. And then she starts saying, I need to give my life back to the Lord. And she just starts pouring her heart out. Um, those kind of things would start to happen to me. And we would do things like, okay, now you're going to go. And this was during the Troubles um, when the Protestants and the Catholics were fighting. Um, we went into a downtown Belfast junior high. Really rough. Like, as we're going up the stairs, everyone is giving us profane gestures. <laughs> rough you know like they're used to fighting i mean this is catholic protestant stuff shank hill falls road stuff and britain has bible classes but they're not allowed to preach the gospel but they're allowed to bring somebody else in to preach the gospel it's different than america so they brought us in and they said it was a junior high a rough junior high and they said go ahead and give your testimony and you can just and as i went in something inside of me which was the holy spirit just said I felt a presence to say, like, speak the truth clearly, tell of your testimony, and challenge them. And I just started speaking and um, telling the testimony and then started challenging them about the accessibility of Jesus and about salvation. And suddenly the room shifted and the students started asking, like, how do I follow the Lord? From giving me profane gestures to what do I do to be saved? How do I follow the Lord? Tell me more. And um, I've had these experiences a lot. And I've been back to Ireland a number of times, worked in ministry, um, to the point where the Lord had to convince me, as I would do youth ministry, students would just come out, and these are on like, come out of the street, and come up to me and saying, tell me how to follow the Lord. Just like, it was very much, and I found before, that the biggest challenge is actually not being afraid and stepping out, that really the fields are ripe for harvest if we will just step out in faith. So that was my introduction, but what really started pushing me over was back in 2015, um, as I would walk to Asbury, the Lord would start to speak to me in my spirit and say things like this. I would walk from my house to hear it in the art department. I would start to hear this inside of my spirit. I'm about to move in a way where people with addictions will not need 12-step plans. They'll be immediately freed from addictions. You're about to see miracles, and you're about to see revival come. And... Um, Things that I didn't have a good, I'd never seen before, but I was trying to believe him. You know, sometimes so you can describe something, but you've never experienced it. Kingdom things started coming, and um, a number of really interestingly strange things started happening. Things started to change from, I would do prayer ministries on Sundays, you know, and I was, I would help in the church. I was an elder for a number of years at the local vineyard church. When it changed from just doing that kind of stuff to, um, really taking the call, the kingdom call to to every single moment of my day, trying to be aware of what, what Jesus was doing and being surrendered to him for every moment, to know what he was doing and not just to like say, I surrender to you, but actually co-labor with him. There's a difference. There's a difference saying I surrender, another difference when will you, like Peter, will you feed my sheep and will you watch what I'm doing and do and do what I'm doing and so <clears throat> I think when this started so I started talking about hearing these things as I'm, I'm walking and I'm praying as I'm walking one mile to work but then this strange thing happened that was kind of a catalyst and um, I was in my studio here in maybe September of 2015 and I just as I'm here I'm just I'm just working on paintings I just felt like the Lord said check your landline which is strange because no one ever calls on this landline here anymore. It's like very rarely you'll, I mean, maybe I'll get a message twice a year, just very, very few times when I check it. And I, there's actually a message on there. <clears throat> it's, it's not used very much anymore. Most times 
text or has her email or something like that. But I checked it and there was a message from somebody that I couldn't understand because they were from a different part of America. And I had to listen to it three times to understand what it was saying. And the message went like this, was I'll just leave the guy's name out of it for his sake. But um, the message went like this, hey, this is, I'll just call the guy John. This is a guy named John. Um, I'm an artist in Santa Fe and the Lord put me, put Asper in my heart, and um, I just thought I'd just call and talk to you about, you know, could you give me a call back, no pressure. I was like, okay. You know, so I did what I considered to be due diligence. At this point in my career, I, I still couldn't completely see that not everything in art was about business. In other words, when somebody called about art, up to this point I was still thinking, well, they're calling business. Maybe they want to do like a workshop or they maybe want me to go out to a workshop. Maybe they want a painting, which had been the precedent. So I thought, I'll just do due diligence for the art department. So on my way out, I went outside and called this guy back. And immediately I could tell this conversation was something was going in a different direction. Because he was like, oh yeah, Chris, um, yeah, this is, it, would, it had been like a week. <laughs> He's like, so he's like, so this is why I'm calling. So he said, I'm a figural artist in Santa Fe, and I also have like a tattoo shop. And I was, and this guy's a believer. He says, so I was in prayer in the morning, and then as I was in prayer, in the front of my eyes, I saw these letters pass in front of my eyes, and the letters were A S B U R Y, and he said, I had no idea what that was. So I asked the Lord, what's an Asbury, <laughs> and he said. So I, the Holy Spirit said, well, look it up. So he said, so he's telling me the story, I'm reiterating. So he looks on Google. He's like, oh, Asbury is a Christian university. And then he hears the Holy Spirit inside of himself say, now look at the art department. And then he looks at the art department. Now, then he hears a word inside of himself say, now look at this guy named Chris Sigri Lewis and personally call him up. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and he says, that's why I'm calling. And um, at that point, I just a, you know just a moment ago I said I'd started to hear the Holy Spirit saying these miraculous freedoms and healings were about to come, and also a move of God was coming. But I didn't have a place for it. You know, I hadn't seen a lot of breakthrough in my own life with just like sin issues or whatever. Um, but at that point, I thought to myself, Oh, this guy must be really walk in the spirit so he tells me some stories of like how he does ministry and you know he he says well you know sometimes I'll get up and the Lord will say I want you to buy a plane ticket he won't tell him where and he and he, he tells stories of him buying a plane ticket going into a city the Lord says to go to this place and then within by the end of the day he's speaking to thousands and thousands of people on a stage ministering to about the Lord and I'm like oh this guy like knows about following maybe he'll understand these things that i'm hearing so i said hey i've been hearing these things and this is all within a 20 minute conversation on the phone when am i going to see breakthrough in these things and um then he said something that was very profound but yet very simple he, he just was praying and he said you know chris my sense here is that you are going to see the breakthrough you're looking for when you understand the pleasure that god takes over you which was like a very simple statement. I was like, huh. I was like, well, hey, well, let's talk more. <clears throat> let's talk more. And we'd scheduled a call again to consider this. And I got off the phone with him, but then something strange happened, <laughs> which is kind of like was a beginning catalyst, which I believe the Lord was initiating. Remember, the Lord spoke to him and told him to call me. So this was the Lord using the body internationally to do something in me and do something in the world. From that point, I started to like all day long, a couple of things happened. I started to hear this thing inside of myself and see these pictures in my head. It was like I saw an open heaven where there was like, it was like those Renaissance paintings that are like a circular dome. You see angels circling around. But I saw the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit dancing around above my head saying, Chris, I'm so pleased with you. I'm so pleased with you. And I kept hearing this voice saying, I'm so the father's voice saying, I'm so pleased with you. Now, a couple of things started happening at that point. About a week or two later, you know, I struggled like everyone does with the sin, some kind of sin that like, that sets you. The sin immediately came off of me. 
that I struggled with for years, for years, and years and years and years. And then that voice, I started to, and then when I would be around people, the voice of the Lord became very loud inside of myself. And it became like, I would see and hear what the Lord's heart was and what he was about to do. He would say, I am doing this and this person speak this thing out to them. And I didn't have a strong frame of reference, but as I started to obey with that, things started happening. The next thing that happened was, as I prayed for somebody, as I started praying for folks, I would I never felt anything visceral. You know, a lot of people, especially in charismatic and, and Pentecostal circles, would talk about visceral sensations. And Paul says in scripture, train your senses so that you'll understand godliness. So your, all your five senses, but there's, um, suddenly when I pray, I would start to feel, <laughs> I didn't have a reference for this. It was like electricity or energy coming out of my arms and my hands. And um, this is when I saw the first supernatural healing. I'd never seen it, but I'd always believed it in my life. I'd always read the scriptures saying, oh Lord, I believe Jesus, you did all these. I believe you still do this. Why don't we see them today? Why is it when we pray, you say that anyone who believes, these signs will follow. That's anyone. You'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. You know, these kind of signs, but I'd never seen them. And um, one day a girl came to church and I was in prayer ministry and she was crumpled over because she'd had a major, some kind of back injury, um, like this, crumpled over. And she came up for prayer. And as I was praying for her, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, just command her back, the pain to go away. And I just did that. As I did that, I felt something move out of my hands, like, very similar to, I think, in the, in the Gospels, when the woman touched the garment, the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus felt dunamis, the Greek word for like power, leave him. And he knew that something, had, a power source had left him. And he looked around and said, who touched me? And um, I felt this kind of, and then her, the, the girl's immediate reaction was her back went like this, straightened just like that. And she goes, oh, the pain's gone. And um, the interesting that I was not convinced. <laughs> The next day, I, I actually saw her husband, and I said to her husband by herself, I said, hey, did your wife really feel better? Did she really get healed when I prayed for her? Because I didn't know. I mean, I wanted to check it. I wanted to, to empirically check this. And he's like, oh, yeah, she was at a very high pain level because of her back. And immediately, she was better. I was like, huh, interesting. Within the next week, when I was in public, things like that would happen all the time. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <coughs> um, and this time it wasn't in church settings. Um, this was like in the barber shop. Somebody would, I wasn't looking for it. It was like the Lord was looking for me. Suddenly my eyes were opened to the need and to his ability supernaturally to meet the needs of the world. And um, people would say, I, I can't barely walk. I have this issue. And I would just inside myself, the Lord would say, Pray for this person, I will heal them. So I didn't even, you know, it was a lot for me to step out in public. People I didn't know to say, hey, I know this is strange, but can I pray for you? And I'd pray for them, and they'd immediately get up and so say, whoa, this is strange, but all the pain just left my body. And it would happen like three times in a week, and it would happen, and things like this would start to increase to the point where I was actually nervous about going out in public because it didn't matter where I was, I would just have this understanding that the Lord was always working. The Father was always working. And I would, whether I was in a line returning things at Lowe's or I was returning something at Sam's or I'm buying something, um, things would happen and there would be a public display of the power of God. You know, people would be immediately healed or there'd be a prophetic word that would turn somebody's direction, would cause somebody to repent, would cause somebody to completely sober up and turn their heart towards the Lord. Things like this started happening. I would say it was daily and then it became, you know, somewhere between daily to multiple times a week when I would go out because you had to work. And, um, and it would happen in classes too. And um, it would happen here at Asbury where I remember I was in a figure drawing class and a girl said, I could see she had pain on her face. And I said, hey, how are you doing? She's like, uh, I've had chronic back pain for six years. And she was like, I said, do you mind if we pray for you? She's like, sure. So there was a girl in class who I, I felt like 
the Lord was really, his hand was upon her. I said, hey, do you mind if this girl prays for you? Would you be willing to pray for this girl? So me and this other girl prayed for this girl, and immediately the pain went away in her back. And she'd had six years. And then I didn't tell her to do this, but um, she came in Monday morning. So it was on Friday, early in class, to testify to everybody in class that it was the first time in six years she was able to do any kind of like gardening at all. And she said all the pain was gone. And she came in. I wasn't even in the class yet. She came in early to testify. And that started happening a number of times. And, um, you know, so that was the beginning of it. That was the beginning of it. The story goes on to how I ended up going to other countries and working with evangelists and leaders in other countries um, to do that same kind of thing on the streets. So... As this stuff started in the fall of 2015, I was at a, a regional kind of like worship, prayer, evangelist, um, healing conference. And during the worship set, I just heard the voice of the Lord inside me say, I'm calling you home. I didn't know what he meant. <laughs> Actually was scared because I had three children at the time, little children, now I have four. And I said to the Lord in worship, I don't want to die. I have three little kids. I can't go home yet. I thought he meant heaven. <clears throat> and I felt like that's not what he meant. And then after that, sir, after the, the worship and the service ended, two or two sisters who were about 50 years old from an inner city Chicago Latino church came up to me, um, two sisters, and said, the Lord told us to pray for you, to come over here and pray for you. Um, I was like, sure. And as they laid hands on me, these two ladies, they started praying and prophesying over me, saying, you think you're going this way, but you were going up, which is a reference in Scripture to Jerusalem, going up to Jerusalem. I suddenly heard the Holy Spirit inside of me say, I'm calling you home to Israel. I'm calling all of my children home, back home right now, to Israel, this point in history. And then I'm like, whoa, what is that? Um, I knew enough about this because of my dealings with with, with it friends in Israel to understand that this was what was called an Aliyah. And my family is Jewish by birth on both sides. I'm an immigrant from Jamaica and some of the oldest synagogues in the West are in Jamaica from the 1500s and so. And my grandmother would always, you know, my grandmother's passed away, but when she would come to America and visit us, because we immigrated in the 70s, every once in a while when the room would get quiet, it was just me and her, she would stop and say, Chris, I just need to let you know that my mother was a Jewess, she was a Levy, and that you are a Jew. You need to know this. And that's all that was, uh, you know, my, my other relatives would say, our family is Portuguese Jewish, we're Sephardic, just letting you know this. Even though we went to church and we were believing in Jesus, it was just something in the back of my mind. And then suddenly this thing happens, this calling, and I didn't even know what it meant. Um, what is that, you know, it was a call to immigration, which... In some senses, it's completely impossible because the moment you believe in Jesus or Yeshua, you are no longer eligible for immigration in Israel. It's actually on the right of the law of um, naturalization. You can do anything else if you're Jewish. You can be Buddhist, you can be Hindu, you can be whatever. The moment you claim Yeshua or Jesus, you are suddenly accepted. It's the last line on there, which is really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> so, in the fall, of, in the spring, in January, right before I came back to classes in 2016, <clears throat> this increased to the point where I heard a very direct calling to do ministry and to like bless the people that the Lord was about to do something in Israel where an Aliyah is not just one person, it's a whole region of people, Jews coming back to Israel. And um, I can explain more about this, but this is what had me working in Israel. Um, I shouldn't even call it work because it's such a blessing. It's just a joy. But, but for instance, when Russia broke down, when communism broke down in, in Soviet Union, a million Jews came back to Israel. The, some of them just walked back. And some of them didn't even know why they were going. They were Russian Jews. They just said, I felt I was supposed to start walking, and here I am. And generally the law in Israel, unless you believe in Jesus or Yeshua, Yeshua is that the moment you step into the soil and you're Jewish, you're suddenly, you're immediately a citizen in Israel. That is what's called an aliyah. But this word that I had, as I was praying, the Lord said, this is what I'm doing right now. 
I'm anointing a group of people in Israel to heal the sick and heal every single disease because there's a great Aliyah coming back from the West, from North and South America. And when they come back, I'm going to heal them as they come back, which is a reference to Exodus. When they went, when they crossed the Jordan, I think it was when they crossed the Jordan of the Dead Sea, the Red Sea. Um, when they crossed, it says they were all healed as they entered the land. And so I shared this with a friend of mine who's an evangelist pastor in Israel, an Israeli. And this is what ended me up going there. <laughs> he said, Chris, this, and he does a lot of street evangelism. He's Israeli. And he said, this is what we've been praying for. We've been wanting to see healing happen again because scripture says that to the, the Greeks seek, I think it says knowledge, or, but the Jews seek a sign in scripture in the New Testament. It says, we've been looking for this. And so I just encouraged him. I said, I believe this is for you. I said, just go out and just pray for folks. Just continue to just keep seeking it and you're going to start to see healing. And so I, I said, in the fall, when I get sabbatical, I want to come and do an art show from Israel, from, from places where there's been a prophecy in scripture that have not been fulfilled. I'll come and work on the street with you too, with your, while, as I'm doing that as well too, doing this art show, doing this sh painting work. And he says, okay. So he just keeps praying and sharing and evangelizing and these groups of Israelis who know Yeshua start doing this. And um, I get an email from him saying, it happened. Um, I saw my first healing and the healing went like this. He was in a bus in Jerusalem and a lady got on the bus who was crumpled over, older, with a cane. And he says, I felt the Holy Spirit say, go up and sit next to her and ask her if you can pray for her and ask her how she's doing. So he went up and sat next to her and he, she, he said, so how are you doing? And she's like, oh, my entire body is breaking apart, full of pain. I just went to the top rabbis and had them pray over me, but nothing happened. Um, and he said, well, have you ever been prayed for in the name of Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus, um, which is where we get Joshua from. And she's like, what good is he going to do me? And he's like, well, it can't hurt. And this is a very Jewish conversation, you know, and this is all in Hebrew. And she's like, okay. Um, and so he prayed over her and she turns to him and says, I don't know if this is all in my head or if this is psychological, but all of the pain just left my body completely left my body and he said praise God that was Yeshua healing you and from that day they started to see people being healed and when the amazing thing is that when somebody receives a touch from the Lord like that in the hearts of the Jewish people they're hardwired a sign and a wonder to to understand that God has been in their midst it's different than in the West is that they're hardwired for this and people would start to come to the Lord. People would start to come to faith. And by the time I got there in October, they were going out and um, in pairs of twos and in one kind of outreach, they went out and would see 20 miraculous encounters, miracles at one time, including one guy who had been shot by a terrorist. Um, his back, his spine had been completely severed by the bullet. They prayed for him. They called him a week later and he was walking. I mean legit miracles like recreative rec recreating things that science and medicine can't do at this point recreating spinal the spinal cord reattaching it recreating and um so by the time i got there things are just increasing it and so i got there and it, and we would go out in the street and pray and the very moment as as i was and it was a lot for me to do this i'm kind of a homebody i'm not necessarily just like I, w I don't want to leave my family but I felt the calling so strong to go and just to see especially and my um, provost really wanted me to go to Israel to do artwork so that was my main goal but this was another goal here too was just to to aid them and just ministry of mercy to praying for the sick and things like this um, so immediately as we went on the streets we started seeing amazing signs and things things were happening that would blow my mind. I mean, I didn't have a, I was learning from the Lord at the time. So the very first day I met with my friend, um, we first said, okay, let's pray first. And he was a, he's a pastor of outreach and evangelism. So we prayed and we just wrote down what we were sensing in prayer. And as we prayed immediately in my mind's eye, I saw a woman 
in the park bench next to the zoo, in the zoo. There's a park next to the zoo in the city wearing white. And the Holy Spirit said, she has a herniated, in my spirit, I just heard this word in my thoughts. She has a herniated disc. I'm going to heal her. And then I saw somebody underneath a bridge with red. And the Lord said, he has a knee condition. And we saw, I'm just, we're, this isn't a 10 to 20 minute period. We're writing all this down. I'm <clears throat> being directed by the Father. Then I saw a person who will have a patch on their eye with glasses over the patch, then a woman with a wheelchair, and then a man with a crutch underneath his left arm. You'll see him with a back injury. Um, and we're like, okay, let's go test this. I mean, it was a lot of faith. We went out in, in a two. And my friend was so gifted at evangelism. He's also an exceptional Hebrew linguist. He would interpret for the generals in the army. Just exceptionally like gifted at communicating the gospel and just communicating in general. And I knew enough Hebrew to get to the bathroom and buy a shawarma. <laughs> That's about it. You know, can, so we said, okay, Father, show us what you're doing. Just like um, Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father doing, and I only say what he's, I see him, what he's saying. So let's go to the zoo and see if what we're hearing is correct. We went to the zoo, went to the park next to the zoo, and looked over where I thought I saw in my mind's eye. And there was a woman sitting at that park bench wearing white. Oh, there's that woman. This is what we saw. So we went up to her, and this is all in Hebrew. Um, and we started talking to her, said, hey, we don't want, we're just praying for people. Just do you have any conditions that we could pray for? We're just praying for the Lord to heal you. And she responds in Hebrew, Oh, I haven't heard any disc in my back, which is the word we heard. And um <coughs> so we so we asked, Do you mind if we pray for you? Sure. We pray for her. The woman starts weeping and says, all the pain just left my body. And then we just started praying. Do you mind if we pray and bless you? We started blessing you. In the end, this woman immediately just caught this revelation. Her entire family came to the Lord, including her children, and um, touched their entire family because of this like mercy work of healing and miracle. And that was in the first five to 10 minutes. And they were like, okay, Let's go to the next spot. <clears throat> and he knew the city pretty well since this was his home. And he knew exactly when I saw something, he would say, oh, I know where that is. And so we thought, went to this next place underneath the bridge. And there was a person there with this red bag. And we talked to this person. They're like, yeah, I have a knee injury. We prayed for this person to start moving their knees saying, oh, my gosh. I haven't been able to move my knee in 20 years. Immediately healed. Like it was. And then we went and we started walking. And then suddenly we see a man with a patch underneath his underneath his glasses and we're like there's the guy <laughs> and then we went to the guy and said hey can we pray for you and he said no 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 because a lot of times they'll do that and he no no can't pray for me and then we said listen this is why we're coming to you because we were praying and the holy spirit the ruach HaKodesh, said dude you'd see a man with a patch under his eye under glasses and when we told him that he said oh yes then you can pray for me the the word opened his heart we prayed for him and then we started walking further, and then a woman comes up in a wheelchair, who's like in her 90s. And we um, prayed for her, and she had a, 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 somebody who was taking care of her, a caregiver. And my friend said, this woman is probably a Holocaust victim, and has probably never heard the gospel in her life. Because many, most, most Jews have never heard the gospel. They think of Jesus or Yeshua as like a Norse god, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Northern European god that you know, they don't know that he's a Jewish rabbi from, <laughs> from 2,000 years ago, one of the greatest Jews ever. And we, sh he, we just sat and just like prayed for her body, prayed for all her pains, and she couldn't speak very well, and just shared in love, shared the entire gospel in Hebrew in her native tongue. And then we thought, well, let's go get something to eat. And as we were crossing the city center, I looked over and I saw a man with a crutch underneath his left arm with a back injury. Um, who would obviously a war it was a war wound and um, I said look there he is um, and my friend went running over to him this is in the, the it would be the equivalent of um, Madison Square Garden or Times Square the busiest part of the city and then he came over to us and we started talking to him this is all in Hebrew and he said you know it's the funniest thing I never come down this street I was going down another street something told me you need to change streets and come down this street <laughs> This man, this is all in Hebrew. And he said, well, we were just here just sharing, just praying for the sick. Um, 
And we said, can we pray for you? And you could see that he had surgeries on his back. It wore, and he said, sure. And we prayed for him. And then he says, all the pain just left my body. And then we, in the middle of the city square, shared the entire gospel, the good news to him, um, of the kingdom, of, and um, right there, like in the midst of thousands of people. And that was the first day. That was within two hours. <laughs> and that pretty much set the precedent for the trip, things like that. And that was I was there for about a month, three weeks to a month. Those kind of things happened almost everywhere we went, including in front of the Knesset building in Jerusalem. We had a similar situation like that happen where we were just walking through. We were in Jerusalem the day after Trump got elected and he announced that um, the uh, embassy was moving to Jerusalem, the American embassy, for the first time we were recognizing it. We were actually on embassy road that day. And we were just walking through the city, trying to get back to our car, walking through the park um, that's right in front of the Knesset, Independence Park. And then we met a, a lady who said hi to us, an older Russian Jewish lady. This is all in Hebrew. And um, as we met her, my friends and I, their older friends, Israelis, I had a sense that this woman had pain in her fingers and her back. And I said, do you have pain? I just, the Lord is like, she has pain here. She's like, yes, I do. How'd you know that? I said, well, we're just praying as we walk. Can we pray for you? And she's like, yes, you can pray for me. And so we stopped at a park bench and I would pray and my friends would translate. And we just asked her if we could lay hands on her and pray in love. And she's like, sure. And as we prayed, the woman said, um, in Hebrew, said, uh, I feel heat and fire going through my body. What is that? <laughs> she would feel this hot. And that's scripturally and experientially throughout the contemporary ages, you see that that is a sign of the Holy Spirit moving. And then she suddenly said, all my pains left my fingers and my back. And, she, and we had to help her up to the bench beforehand. And as we left, we said, can we help you down? She goes, I don't need any help. And she jumped down. And this lady was in her 70s. And those kind of things would happen. We would get the information, just like if they needed any help, if they wanted to know more about the Lord, about their faith, and um, they would follow up with them. But that was kind of how things went, like every day almost. <laughs> and that's how I ended up like, Connecting, and so when I sometimes when I go back, I go back and I, you'll see lots of paint. This painting behind me here is a painting I'm working on of northern Israel, where as I'm painting, I'm praying over the land, praying for what the Lord is doing, praying for revival, awakening, for um, His blessing over the land. And as I'm doing that, things are happening all the time. As I'm going to places like this, it's a really, it's a really great symbiosis of um, art and ministry. I'm trying my best to learn Hebrew. I do my best to learn it. So every time I go, it gets a little bit better. This time when I went, I was able to understand about 70% of, of what people are saying, which was a huge jump. That doesn't mean I'm able to communicate back. But when I hear them talking, this time I was with a number of guys and girls, Israelis, and they're talking and they're constantly teaching me as we're going because I'm. the Lord had put in my heart earlier this year that you need to get serious about learning this. This is this needs to become a heart language for you. So I started to like be, become serious with learning Hebrew and teaching my children Hebrew. So my children are trying to learn it, like putting up little things around the house, you know. This is what this is in the bathroom. And I start to, you know, and so I'm it's really my heart's desire to learn it. <clears throat> but I will tell you that I don't know it. I would know it enough to, to kind of get around, but not enough to actually communicate my heart or to be able to function well in daily life. I think that these events were major for Israel because even in the Messianic congregations they weren't really seeing this until the summer of 2016. This is when it was kind of like the miraculous was, it's, I would say that it was always available but starting to be reintroduced um, back into the congregations. Uh, because it's so effective of like it's see the thing is it's it's not just a sign it's an act of love that's the thing is that it's a way of tangibly loving <clears throat> and the way of God showing love for people doing something that no one can do right which is it's like it's one thing to say you know I love social justice or I love like caring for the sick or it's another thing to see God caring for somebody and and seeing a vision of the Lord Jesus or Yeshua coming up to somebody and saying, I'm wanting, I'm seeking this person out. I love this sheep, this person. They have this condition. I'm wanting to heal them. And you going and following what you're, you're sensing him doing, 
it being accurate and then being immediately healed, that is a totally different thing altogether. <laughs> so I, I think people are actually doing this all over the world. I think we see it a lot less in, in the West, partially because we don't believe it's possible. But the thing is, it's completely available. Actually, if you actually read scripture, you see that that these things are actually the normal Christianity. They really are. If you read that, the book of Acts is a primer to how we should live. We are in the middle, the end part of the book of Acts. It's a primer. It's um. It's it's when when G, when Jesus healed the sick, it's it didn't say I'm going to show you a sign and heal the sick, even though it was a sign. It was also an act of the love of God. It was also fulfilling prophecies, and we in Him continue to do that. So, for instance, I'm the God who heals all of your diseases, as it says in the Psalms. Or, by His stripes we are healed. Or, in Isaiah, He bore our afflictions; surely He took our pains. That was fulfilled in Yeshua Jesus, and it's also fulfilled in the body of Him, which is us, the believers. And so. When he looked at the crowd, it says in one section of the New Testament, and you're talking thousands of people, he looked upon them and healed all of their diseases. Now, he said, it looked, sorry, I'll repeat it. He looked upon them, had compassion on them, and healed all of their diseases. The key there is Jesus says that a lot of times. It says in the scripture, it lets you know he has compassion to suffer with. It's an act of love, of like, act of love to loving somebody. Is that it, it really is an act of love. And for me, the thing that I love so much about it is that it's love. Is that it's like, the, it's one of the most tangible ways of showing love, is that showing the love of God. It's one thing to say, oh, God loves you. It's another thing to see God loving somebody and seeing God moving in their life, joining in what he's doing, and standing in the gap, like Ezekiel says, I'm looking for a man, I'll just say a woman or woman, to stand in the gap between, and, and stand in the gap and bring heaven to earth. So, you know, his prayer said, Father, let it be on earth as it is in heaven, be on earth as it is in heaven. And that's, it's happening all over. I think that just because we don't see it doesn't mean that's not happening. It just means that we have a cognitive distance here where we don't believe it'll happen. Or we don't, if we say that that's happening, if we believe it's accessible, it creates a moral obligation upon us. Does that make sense? So if I if a believer knows that this is this is completely accessible and that he's given you authority, which it says in scripture he has, give you authority to heal the sick, which is an act of love, that puts the onus on us to love people. But if you say, I don't believe that's happening, that takes the responsibility off of you to have to do that. Then you can say, Oh, only Jesus did this, or only the prophets in the Old Testament did this. Does that make sense? But if you but if you know that something is accessible to you, it actually makes you responsible, makes you a steward of this. And I think that that's the thing. And um, I'll just say this is that I've had folks, even family members, some of them, people have different responses. I think that God sets up free will for us in this way where he will always give us the choice whether we receive what he's doing and what he's saying or not. That's free will. So even in the New Testament, after Lazarus is raised from the dead, still people didn't believe. Many believed, and, and certain people did not believe, even though they saw somebody after you know, many days raised from the grave. Um, I think that's there to show that God always gives us a choice. And I've had that same situation happen where even you know certain folks, friends of mine, certain folks will be like, I want that. This has always been my heart to step out in that. And I'll, no problem, it's easy, it's a work of grace. Here, pray for this, and they'll see somebody, something happen. But then I've had folks who know me, who are friends, who say, I don't believe any of it. <laughs> Even when there's testimonies. And I've seen amazing, the Lord do amazing things. I've seen people who are deaf, numbers of people with deaf, have their hearing restored. People who are blind have their, people with back conditions. I've seen people with cancer immediately healed. I've seen people with war wounds, this happened recently where a guy had been run over by a tank in the war in Israel, immediately healed. One leg was shorter because of it. His leg grew out, which is a strange thing. I know it's hard to believe, and I never could understand that until you, once one thing, see the thing is, <clears throat> it's like opening a key. Once you can come to an understanding that all things are possible with God, and nothing that the Lord says is impossible, and understanding that when he spoke the worlds into creation, it wasn't hard for him. 
And his word actually carries the power to obey his word. The power is within his word. So that when the Lord is doing something, he can do anything. Once you start to see that happening, then all things become possible. Then it's like, of course he can do this. It's just, am I going to join him? Because this is where free will comes in. <clears throat> the Lord is looking for us to take part. He doesn't force us. <laughs> and since the Garden of Eden, it's kind of like that, where Adam and Eve were supposed to be co-laborers, sons and daughters with God, and supposed to tend the garden and name the animals. But the moment they obeyed Satan <coughs> and sinned, they gave those keys to him, right? But Yeshua, Jesus, when he died on the cross and was resurrected, he, he went and took the keys back so that now all things are possible. He took back the keys. We're supposed to partner with him. But this is why you see stewardship and the, ser the model of the servant so many times in scripture because he won't make us do it. There's, you can't have a reward and judgment if there's not responsibility and stewardship. Does that make sense? That's why he even told Peter, he said, feed my sheep. See, he wouldn't have told Peter to feed his sheep if Peter didn't have a choice whether to feed his sheep. Does that make sense? And this is the hard part about it that my theology and all of this really changed because I grew up in a very predestination-oriented um, church, but my experience is kind of like held that in check. My experiences were, yes, God is sovereign, but we're also responsible. That's what I started to experience, and Scripture kind of leads towards that, and just experience through the history of the church leads towards that, where the hardest thing for me to come to understand was is that even though God desires things, he set up a system of order of, um, the best way I can put it is when you um, delegate authority, you know, a general doesn't do everything in the army. A general tells the colonels to do things, and the colonels tell the majors to do things, the majors tell the next level, and then the captains and the lieutenants, the lieutenants tell the general listed to do things. Does that make sense? It's a very similar setup where we have choices, and the hardest thing to, I think one of the hardest theological shifts for me is that I can see that the Lord is always working, the Father is always working, but am I going to, to join in with what he's doing? Am I going to agree with him? And this is where you get the scripture. And this is how this has worked in my life. Where in Luke it says, whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. That's how it reads in the Greek. Whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. Right? It's hard to understand that until you understand that we are just following what heaven's wanting to do. And when you see what heaven's wanting to do and you join with heaven, with the Father in heaven, things happen because he's already wanting to do it. This is why Jesus, and he's our model. Jesus says, I don't act on my own initiative. I only do what the Father's taught me to do, and I only say what he's taught me to say. And he is our model. And if we can, just in intimacy, spend more time with him and just start to learn to cultivate and to clear our ears to hear him, um, to see what he's doing, to hear what he's doing, all things are possible because then you're just agreeing with what he's already doing. And then this is where faith comes in. It is not a, a big deal with me for faith. If I see the Lord doing something or I hear him saying, I'm healing this, I don't have to muster anything up. I just have to get in the, in the line of his fire and agree with him as a witness, right? And then I just, and then I almost know that he's gonna do something because he's, I know he's gonna do it. So I'm just like agreeing with him. I'm not making something happen. I'm just seeing what he's already doing in somebody's life. and concurring with that and asking and like joining as he's delegated with me let heaven let it be on heaven on earth as it is in heaven and that's basically the key to all of this stuff is just aware of what what jesus is doing aware that he's always working that he's active and joining in and obeying there's always a choice to obey so again this is something that if I have one major regret in my walk, and this is a regret that I have in the Western church in general, <clears throat> one major regret is that I wasn't discipled into these things. These things were the bread and butter of the early church, of the early congregations. This was, you know, 
what they learned to do. What did the disciples learn to do with Yeshua for three years? They saw him doing, they did it, they asked him questions. It was a really action reaction internalization kind of thing. So some of this gets into understanding that there's another world that's in the middle of our world, but yet we can't see it, yet it's actually dominant because heaven created earth. We didn't create heaven. We come from heaven. <coughs> in that sense, the earth is, is a spiritual child of heaven and the universe is, if that makes sense. And you see this in Genesis. It spoke things into creation. And then here we are. But all in the midst of it, one thing that you see too is that in a Romans, the book of Romans, it says that because of their sin, their minds were darkened and they stopped seeing God and they started worshiping idols, started worshiping creation, right? It says that in the book of Romans. What does it look like when we were restored to the cross back to him? It means we start to see him again, start to see his intentions, start to worship him, and then the original order starts to come back into place. Heaven's original order, if that makes sense. So. What does that look like? Well, this is one of, you know, I am, there's a part of me, I'm a professor that is an academic, that I'm interested in how these things work. <laughs> and I know a lot of the folks in the world, personally, who kind of like, this is their area of research, miracles, supernatural, these are academics. And so I always ask the questions, how is this working? I wanna know more, because I want to, as a teacher, I want to be able to translate this to other people and make it accessible to them. I don't like knowledge being like um, sitting in a white ivory tower. If it's there, it should be meant for the poorest of the poor. It should be easy for children. And I've taught my children. My, my children walk in this. My daughter walks in the exact same things. It's really wonderful to see <coughs> when she prays for people. So part of it is this is, is there is our imagination. In the West, because of the Enlightenment and empiricism, we've tended to view our imagination as untrustable, especially in the church. We'll say things like, well, that's just my imagination, which is a way of writing off anything that's not visual or material. It's, it's actually a materialist, naturalist way of looking that's infected the church. But we know that we can't see God, but, that, but yet he's, he actually says the pure in heart will see him. So how does that work? There's a tension there. <clears throat> so there's two major ways that people see the Lord. Number one, I think the mo the easiest and the way that's accessible to most people that don't have what a net what is what I call a natural gifting. Uh, so there's basically two ways of seeing. Um, I think one of these ways is is for everybody. Anybody can see in this way, which is allowing the Lord to speak to our imagination. And I believe that the imagination can be like a canvas. I'm using a metaphor there, but but it's an act of surrender. I know this is really difficult, but, <clears throat> but this is especially the case when we were praying. I think a lot of people experience this, and they don't even know that the Lord is speaking to them. Many people will believe, whether they're a believer or, you know, in, in Jesus or not, that people speak, God speaks to them through dreams, right? Which is like our mind subconscious creating images but also the question is is do we just create all those images or do can we actually receive images I think that's the big thing is that it, that's hard for some folks um, I believe and many people believe that you would you can actually receive them now it's scary to some folks the idea and this has to do with a little bit of control but it also has to do with trusting God is that if you can receive them they can be good or bad, or they can be, what if they're not true? What if they're, there's all these questions that go through your mind. But this is why we test everything by the word of God. We test it by the word of God, we test it. And what happens is, is that like, one of the ways I empirically test things is does it actually have fruit that falls in line with scripture, with the fruit of the spirit, with, with the Lord Jesus? And so, if we surrender our minds, our not it doesn't mean that we give our minds up. It's that we're partnering in prayer through meditation with the Lord. Sometimes images will come in and we'll think, oh, that's just my mind, it's my imagination. Could be. Or it could be the Lord trying to talk to you in images. 
about something he's doing or whatever. So <clears throat> this is something that's cultivated. It's kind of like this is that I'll put it this way. When you're hunting or let's say when you're in safari in Africa, I've been on safari. When you first get there, a lot of animals are camouflaged, right? And um, it's hard to tell what they are because they're, they're actually camouflaged so that you won't see them. But the moment you see, let's say, the moment you see an animal and you recognize oh, this is what the animal looks like, you become aware of it in the Mara, in the Masamara, then you start to see it. This is what this looks like for me. And being able to receive this allows you to hear it. There's, there's a principle in scripture that says, that Jesus says, he who has, more shall be given, right? Um, I never understood that until I understood that. It's like, when you take what you have, whatever you have available to you at the moment, whether it's just, all I know how to do and pray is this, and you pray, and you just take little steps, more things are given to you. But you have to be willing to do what you can do. And so for me, it was little baby steps of trying this out. And then I would see things happen. You know, like what I told you about seeing the woman in the bench in white. That was just in my mind. And I kind of heard this thought that, go, like, that would say she's in a bench in the white. And um, she has this condition. But things like this happen to me a lot in church and different places. And what I found is it really has to do... There's a part of us where we have to be open to the Lord doing that. The Lord doesn't force himself. That's this is the, the main point about this is that we have to turn our eyes to the Lord. And as we're worshiping him, as we're turning our eyes and we put ourselves in a, a posture ourselves, and you don't have to always be in like a position of worship, because for me, that can be just standing in a line in a store. I'm just like, I'll just something inside of me will nudge me. The Holy Spirit will say, Hey, why don't you listen to me? What do you why don't you ask me what am I doing right now? And that's when things start to happen. And um, I'll just tell you a story that kind of shows you how this works. It was at our congregation here in Wilmore, and it was during worship. And I just asked the Lord. It just starts with a question, Lord, Jesus, what are you doing right now? It was during worship. And suddenly in my mind's eye, I saw him walking up the center aisle of the congregation to the front. I was all the way in the back, turning left and pointing out a woman that I knew. I didn't even know she was sitting up there, but I know her well. And he said, Chris, do you see this woman? She has um, herniated disc. She has injuries in her L3, L4, and L5 of her lower back. That's what, in my mind's eye, I saw this thing playing out. And Jesus speaking to me. And, and he was speaking to me and saying, she has pain. She's in constant pain in her L3, L4, and L5. And then he turned to me. And this is how it usually works for me, is that I see Jesus doing something. And then he speaks to me and tells me what to do. Which, um, and he says, go to her and pray for her and have mercy in her so that I can heal her. She's in pain. Now, I have no empirical knowledge that this is true. It's only a, a, a word of faith. So after the service, I grabbed a pastor friend of mine and I went to this lady who I'm friends with. I didn't know she had these things. <clears throat> I said, hey, let's call her Jane. That's not her name. I said, hey, Jane. When I was when we were praying when we were in worship, I had a sense that you would you had a, an issue in your back of pain, L three, L four, L five. Is this true? And I asked questions to test if this is true. And she goes, "How did you know that? That's the exact area in my back, L three, L four, L five, and I'm in constant pain. That's why I don't show up to church at times because I'm in so much pain." I said, "Well, do you mind if we pray over you?" She said, "I love that." We prayed over her. Um, she felt better. The next day, she's in a small group with my mother. My mother said, Chris, she came to a small group and said, from the moment you guys prayed for her, all the pain left her body. And now she's in no more pain, zero. And um, that all came from being just turning my mind's eye to asking a question and allowing the question to be answered through my imagination, through the Lord speaking to me, through my mind, through my imagination. <clears throat> and that's about how it happens. Um, it's not... Now, I'll just delineate here. And what I want to delineate between this, because a lot of folks don't understand, there's called... I just call this natural giftings. I don't know if that is like a phrase. It's just something I've made up. <clears throat> there are certain people who are naturally gifted at something. It's still a gift, but it's not necessarily the same thing as this is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It may be a gift from God, 
but not the same thing as I'm praying for a gift and the Holy Spirit then suddenly gives you a gift. It's a little bit different. It's not saying that this is negative or positive. It's just not the same. Um, it's just not exactly the same. It can be used by the Holy Spirit and under submission. So there's friends of mine internationally I know who have audibly heard things and seen things and known things their whole life. So when they say they're, they heard the Lord speak, they're saying they've heard an audible voice speak to them. Um, could this be the Lord? I think at this point in your life, the answer is yes, they, they test it. But the deal is, is that they were seeing and hearing that long before they were ever worshiping the Lord or ever a believer. That is what I consider a natural gift. A natural gift must be brought under the submission of the Holy Spirit. This is what scares people because when people, what scares people in, in the body of Christ is that things aren't always, everything is stewardship. <clears throat> Where we see a natural gift in play in scripture is in the Old Testament with Balaam the prophet. Balaam was like a mercenary prophet. He was not necessarily, it was clear that he was not necessarily like set apart by the Lord for Israel because he was being hired by an enemy nation as the Israelites were coming into Israel. They said, we will pay you to curse Israel. This is a person with a natural gifting. Um, they have a gift, but it's not necessarily under the submission of the Lord, and it can be dark. So he goes up on this hill, he sees Israel coming into the land, and he tries to curse them. But every time he tries to curse them, in response, God blesses them in response. And you know the scripture says, whoever curse, curses you will be cursed, and whoever blesses you will be blessed. I will turn their curses and blessings talks about that in scripture and he keeps trying again to co-curse him and eventually he's he's walking and then two angels show up but he can't see the angels but his donkey sees the angels this is in scripture this is not a metaphor this is a historical document um and he starts to beat the donkey and then this crazy thing happens in scripture the donkey starts talking the donkey turns to him and says basically says, don't you see what's going on? I can't go. There's two angels in your pathway that are blocking you from cursing Israel, right? That is the story of somebody who has a natural gift. It doesn't necessarily mean like, for instance, it's like a, a gift of music. Um, there's gifts of music that are supernatural gifts from the Holy Spirit. There's gifts of music that are natural gifts that are super, still supernatural. They're gifts. Um, we are a spirit, soul, and body. So this is the hard part for a lot of folks any gift that i'm operating in i'll just tell you i don't believe it's a generally believe it's a natural gifting any gift that i've gotten has been me seeking since i've been a believer seeking the holy spirit and then saying i'm going to give you this gift right but i have lots of friends who have super who have gifts of the spirit but also have had gifts since they're born right this is where you get into tricky waters um, this is a whole other subject. For instance, this is where you see the New Age movement, which is like, you know, a great taking away of people from the Lord. Over 90% of people who are in the New Age movement actually came from the church. This is what people don't know. Um, spiritists and things like this. Generally, their story, when you talk to them, was they were in a church that didn't believe that God still did things supernaturally. And they said, God is speaking to me, saying things to me. What do I do with that? And then usually the pastor will say, that is from the devil. That can't be from God. Well, they have something in them that's a gift, but it's a natural gift. And it needs to be any gift that is not disciplined and developed can become used by the enemy. Because, you know, you see this, for instance, in anything in music. We can choose to worship the Lord or we can choose to worship ourselves through our music. We can choose in art. I can choose to worship myself or I can choose to worship the Lord. There's always a choice there. <clears throat> so this is the delineation where some people actually see things with their visual eyes. That's never happened to me. Some people hear God or hear, it, it cannot even be God, but sometimes it is the Lord with their natural hearing. That has only happened to me one time in my life, only once. And I was, I was, I was a freshman here at Asbury. <coughs> And um, I was in a, a prayer group and I was came here really broken and needing a lot of healing. I was a pretty new Christian and needing to be restored and reformed and resurrected. My entire self be like under, be touched by the Lord. And 
it was ministry time at this Bible study group, and I was just so in, riddled with so much fear and bondage. And I remember just praying to the Lord, saying, "Lord, you're gonna have to bring somebody to me because I'm too afraid to like ask somebody to pray." I didn't never. I came from a tradition where I never had anybody really pray for me before, which is funny. I mean, it's it's funny to us, but like that, I just thought nobody would ever want to pray for me. So I was like, "You have to bring somebody." And all of a sudden, my eyes are closed <coughs> like this. I'm just like, Lord, please bring somebody to me because I can't ask. And then I heard an audible voice. It's the only time in my life that's ever happened. And I heard my name called. And it matched scripture because it was a, a powerful yet gentle voice that just said, Chris. And, it, and then it was just like that. And then behind, once the, vo the word was spoken, my name, I heard it was like being in the middle of Niagara Falls. It was like this, Chris. It was like cavernous waters. And scripture calls the voice of God the voice of many waters. This is exactly what it sounded like. A powerful, confident, loving voice, um, male voice that was full of peace that carried behind it. I literally heard waters rushing like a waterfall, like a cavern of waterfalls. That's the only time this ever happened to me. Um, but that, for some people, happens all the time. <laughs> it's surprising and um, to them it's normal um, but this is just um, another one of those areas where it's just kind of like in the end whichever the way that the Lord is like wired you to hear him you need to be faithful with that and check it well I think it has to do with the fear of the supernatural I think it's very fear based and they're also afraid of like getting into uncharted waters and messing stuff up it's legitimate I mean it's legitimate it's kind of like <clears throat> I know people who have gone down roads and this is why surrender and submission to the Lord and the love of the Lord guards our heart and his word guards our heart that if you're not a surrendered person to the Lord in the end gifts are free you don't have to work for gifts. You don't some of these things you don't have to work for. These are, you know, but you have to work to surrender and to love people. You have to actually it's an act of your will to take up your cross daily. That's what Jesus says, take up your cross daily. That's hard. <laughs> that that demands laying your life down. But if you're not wanting to lay your life down, but you're wanting to, to walk in fun things, love guards us and um, surrender guards us to the Lord. So I think many churches have seen people who walk in gifts also be out of submission. And this is something I help a lot of churches with where I end up having a lot of pastor friends over the world. And one of the questions that they ask me is, okay, I have a lady or a man in my church who walks in these things, but yet they want to do whatever they want to do. And yet they scream or they, they want to give a word and, and it's not in the right order. And this is something I've learned, and this is why it's like a love, a shepherd's heart is important. And I believe that the Lord has started, years ago, started to disciple me into his heart, which is a shepherd's heart. He's called the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus has called that, is loving, you are there to serve the body and to serve the Lord. And you're there for the betterment of the body. All of these things, these gifts and these expressions are meant to build up the body. They're not meant to just express ourselves. Even though there's nothing wrong with self-expression, you know, a song, a this, a that, a word, <clears throat> but everything is in the order. And it's in the order of seeking not our own gain, but seeking seeking the betterment of others first. So I think that the, the fear is, number one, is they've seen it abused by people who have not been discipled well or are not under submission to the Lord. Right, and also they've seen heresy arise throughout history. I mean, for instance, the Mormon Church. <laughs> you have a man, a carpenter in New England, seventeen hundreds or whatever that is, <clears throat> Joseph Smith, who suddenly sees a vision of golden tablets and an angel named Hiram or whatever saying all these things. Well, this is why the Scripture tells us to test the spirits because. Not every angel is of God. The demonic is angels too. Not every spirit is God's spirit. We actually have to test these things. And testing comes through intimacy and relationship and through the word of God. You know, test it with the word. You know, It also says specific questions to ask the test. So 
Joseph Smith is not testing the spirits. And suddenly he's leading millions and millions of people away from the Lord. And I love Mormons. I mean, the thing is, they're wonderful people, but there's heresy there, right? Because there's immaturity in supernatural things that's not first given under the submission of the cross. And this is what pastors are afraid of, I think. And just these two things, I think if people, if they had it displayed, and this is part of one of my callings, is how do you display the love of God, the activity of God, but surrendering to the, you know, looking for the needs of the body first. If everyone did this, we would not, we would see it all the time. <laughs> but there's a whole lot of fear about it because of that. <clears throat> and that's something that I've I've learned that that part of it is, is modeling how to model this in love and in surrender and submission to the body and to the Lord. I like them, but I like all the churches generally. <laughs> Here's something I found. It doesn't matter what church I go into, I see the Lord moving in them. They may not see it, but I see it. And the Lord will do miraculous works in any church. And he's wanting to. He's wanting to restore that relationship to understand that it's not just conceptual knowledge. Any church I go into, I see the Lord moving and things happen. It doesn't matter. I've even gone back to my home church as a child, which is a cessationist church, and immediately I see things happening. They're not prepared for it, but then they receive it. I've seen things happen where it's just, I just want to be obedient to the Lord. And if I see him doing something and telling me to say something, I don't force things. But if I see an open door of love, I'll walk into it and things happen. The point is that God doesn't just move in charismatic or Pentecostal churches. He moves anywhere he's welcomed, <laughs> anywhere. And some of the most open people to the Lord, and you see this in scripture too, are people who are not even called by his name. For instance, why did the Samaritans receive him so abundantly, revival going on in Samaria, yet his own Jewish people rejected him? That's a question that's been in my head. It's because whoever will hear the voice of the Lord, whoever will hear the word of the Lord and respond to him, he'll open the door. So I think that that's, that's what I think about charismatic, and I love them. I think a lot of times the thing that turns people off is that they experience a lot of things because they're open to it, but when they're not experiencing it, they feel like sometimes in the charismatic churches, they feel like they have to work towards that experience. And there's a, a disconnect. They think that like the experience is, is the relationship with the Lord. So if they're not experiencing God in a charismatic way, they need to push forward so that they feel loved. Does that make sense? When that's just not true. We, we, we Actually, what scripture says is we are seated with him in high places in Ephesians 6. Actually, seated with Jesus, we actually stand in a position of always being in pleasure and in, in love, in a heavenly place with him, connected with the Father. He comes and dines with us. From that position, the works of God comes out. From that comes the work of God, comes the supernatural, the anointing to like touch this world. We're already in that position. The the works don't prove the position, the works flow out of that position of love. That's a really key identity subject that for me was the, the revealing of that is that once I understood that I was already there and what the Lord had done on the cross and what he bought for me, this love walk, suddenly the works came naturally. And also there's a verse that I challenge people with. Jesus says, if your heart does not condemn you, ask me whatever you will and it'll be given to you. The problem is, is that we think that we can walk with him in unrighteousness, our prayers won't be answered because there's an accuser of the brethren, Satan, who stands in heaven and says, you can't answer their prayers. They're walking in open sin. They're walking in adultery. They're walking in, in they're lying to people. They are openly, in their hearts, are hating people and not repenting of it. They're walking in sexual sin and sexual identity bondage, and they are saying, I can walk in identity bondage. I can walk in whatever that may be. It could be you're just fornicating or you're fornicating in other ways, like homosexual ways or whatever. And they're thinking that they can get whatever they want from you and walk in this open sin. When your word, God, and see Satan accuses us, 
your word, God, says, if their conscience doesn't condemn you, but I condemn them before you because they're walking when you've provided freedom for their bondage. So I think one of the reasons why a lot of people don't see this is because they're not walking in righteousness. They're not actually receiving the supernatural power of God. The same power of God that heals the sick and that causes miracle happens is the same power of God that can take somebody who is an alcoholic their whole life and completely free them, and I've seen that happen. Or it's the same person who, let's say somebody is like struggling with same-sex attraction, can touch them in a moment, and he touched me in an area of bondage, immediately I was free. And then immediately, because I was my heart wasn't condemning him anymore, everything I asked started to come out. And I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked that the word was true. <laughs> that was the hard part. It was like, whoa, how is it that every prayer I'm asking is being answered? Because my, because he suddenly freed me supernaturally from that, from that bondage. And then suddenly, my heart stopped condemning me. And whatever I asked in his name, he started to give me. It's actually, it has to do with righteousness and what he did on the cross and what he did in the resurrection. And when we understand that, we understand all things are possible, doors open up, and then suddenly we become a threat to the, to the kingdom of darkness. The answer is yes and partially no. I'll explain that. Number one, Paul says in the epistles, he says, seek earnestly the gifts. So he's encouraging us and telling the churches, seek the gifts of the Spirit, because the gifts are meant to build the church. You know, just imagine a builder coming in and let's just say one of the gifts was electrical wiring in the church. You need that for the, a building to work correctly. <laughs> That's what the gifts are like. They actually are weapons of warfare against the, the, the kingdom of, of the enemy that actually puts people in bondage. So Jesus came and much of what he did was sickness. Well, if somebody has a gift of healing, um, that comes directly against that and restores the kingdom intention onto that person. You're meant to walk in health. You were not meant to walk crippled. You're not meant to walk in pain. This is what I did. By my stripes, you are healed, right? Um, so I believe anybody can. Now, it also says in scripture, the spirit gives to whatever he out gifts as he wants, but he also gives out callings as he wants too. Basically he talks about, there's a charismata, which are like, healing, tongues, prophecy, words of knowledge. But there's also the domos gifts. And this is where people get confused. These are gifts that Jesus actually gives, which is like, it says he gave gifts to men. This is like pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, um, apostles, which you see in the New Testament there. These are, is when he actually anoints a person for a positional gift to serve the body. Right? A pastor serves the body. An evangelist serves the world and the body. So some of those we can ask for. He may not always give them in the way we want. And some of those he gives out how he wants. For me, my experience with it is, is that like I believe that they were there for the taking. <clears throat> and I sought them out. And as I asked, I received. My, my first gift of the Spirit was the gift of tongues, which is... Funny because it's so controversial, but it's actually somewhat the least of the gifts. But Paul says himself, I wish you would all speak in tongues, because I speak in tongues the whole time. He actually says that. I would have it that you all, that prayer language. And I'm not even sure if he's necessarily talking about the gift of tongues where you just get another language so you can evangelize. That's something, maybe something different. But my experience right after I was born again, saved was I suddenly I knew my mom had spoken in tongues and I was suddenly interested because I had this experience this Holy Spirit born again experience something happened in my room where I felt and I was suddenly a different person I believed upon the Lord Jesus and suddenly in my heart I was like I need to go for this gift of tongues I, didn't, I was 16 I didn't even know why and um, when a group of believers laid hands on me because I was also seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit I was actually seeking the gift of tongues and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit they laid hands on me and I started to feel the room wobble spiritually. I didn't even know how to describe it. it was just, and they just said to me, open your mouth. And when I went to open my mouth like this, blah, 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 this stuff came. And as that happened, my legs gave out and I fell backwards. And um, this is, I'm a 16 year old. I had no, 
no one told me to do this. And as I'm on the ground, I felt visceral waves, like radiating waves, like waves of the love of the Father coming through my entire body. It was like light. And um, I just couldn't move. I was on the ground just weeping with love coming over me. Just, And that was how I entered into the gifts, was this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, and then the thing about the gift, some people think, well, God can, that only happens when God tells you to do that. <clears throat> like any other gift, a gift is stewarded. I recognize that I can open my mouth and decide to pray, and my tongue would just move, and things that I didn't understand would come out, but it would affect how I felt in my spirit. You know, it can be frustrating for folks, that gift, because you're like, well, what does this all mean? And one day, <clears throat> I, I told, talked about this in church, one day, a number of years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was reading through Corinthians. Paul is talking about the organization of the gifts and how they're supposed to be administered in the church, how the order of services and how we defer to one another. And certain people were standing up in Corinth and speaking in tongues, but no one was understanding them. It was from the Lord, but there was no understanding. So people who weren't believers came and they're like, I don't understand what's being said. It was confusing. <coughs> so he said, listen, if you're going to get up on stage and speak in tongues, you should also pray for the gift of interpretation of tongues. And you should have an interpreter so that people who are not believers, it'll actually bless people and they're able to receive it. And then that becomes prophecy. And he said, therefore, whoever speaks in tongues should therefore also, this is in scripture, pray for the gift of interpretation. I was like, holy cow, how is it I've read scripture all this time I've never seen this? Because tongues have been frustrating for me. Because I'm like, why am I even doing this? I don't even understand what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, as, as a student here, I'd pray, and it did lift my spirits. One time I was really depressed, and I felt like the Lord say, worship me and pray in tongues, and then the depression just lifted right off of me. So it did help things, but I still struggled with it, with my mind. Because Paul also says you should pray in the spirit, but also pray with your mind. He's talking about the gift of interpretation there. So I read this. In, I was in my apartment. I read this in Corinthians. And I said, wow, I need to be praying for the gift of interpretation. These two things, he says, go together. <coughs> and um, so I said, okay, Lord, I asked for, you told me to ask for the gift of interpretations because I have the gift of tongues. So I just ask you right now for the gift of interpretations. And I just felt like in my spirit, try it out. I just believed I'd received it because he said, ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door shall be open to you. Seek and you shall find. So I just had this knowledge that if you ask, you're going to receive. So I said, okay, I started to speak in tongues. And then I heard, it was like, in my mind, it was like a teleprompter. It was like my mind just spoke words underneath of it. And I talked about this in church, and the very first thing I heard was, I'm coming soon. I was like, whoa, I just heard something inside of myself. It was like a clear interpretation, like in a teleprompter, like like, like um, closed caption. And I looked around the room, I was like, did that really just happen? <laughs> I was like, let's try it again. And I did it again. And then I heard, Chris, these words in my mind, I'm coming sooner than you think. And from that day, when I start to speak, I start to pray for people. I kind of pray in my spirit and tongues and quietly, and then I'll hear a voice underneath of it. And what happened even that weekend when that first happened was I heard somebody else praying in tongues, and I heard a voice underneath their tongues. And this time when somebody was praying, it was like the voice of the angels singing. And as they were praying in tongues, I heard, Glory to the Lord in the highest. I would just hear this underneath their tongues. Um, and from that day, that opened the door for other things. And this is where when Jesus says, He has more shall be given. That door, I didn't even ask for prophecy. Prophecy came through that. Because if you're hearing the Lord, you're hearing prophecy. Because how the Lord speaks is prophecy. His words cause things to happen, cause new realities, restoration to happen. And prophecy came through that. I'll just say this. There are their faculty, who I won't name them, who walk in these gifts, but they're afraid to talk about them. So a lot of times I will know them and I will kind of encourage them in this <clears throat> and show them that God has given you this gift to bless people, to bless the body of Christ, to help people know the immediate will, what's going on right now, and to know the Lord's love for them. A phrase you'll hear is um, academic or intellectual skepticism. A lot of folks see a lot of the ways that we're trained people intellectually in, in the West <coughs> is to train to be, rather than to say what's possible, which is a great question, to, to train them to ask the question, 
to be skeptical, to immediately assume that something is not true if it's not naturally, if it's not materialistic, if not empirically provable, to assume that it's not true, right? And you have to actually prove that it is true rather than say, I believe this is possible. Let me see, test this to see if it is possible. Does that make sense? Most of what our training is, even in the church and even in the academics who are in university settings, is to say, that can't be possible. I would have to be proved to me that it was possible. So it's like, I call it the razor's edge. Um, the difference is, is what they expect to find. If you expect to find that something is not true, like Roman says, you're going to go in and it's cognitive dissonance. You're going to expect to not see it. Many people choose to not walk in these things because it really is a control issue, is what it is. is it's, it's, a, it's a worship. See, the mind is a gift from the Lord, but we can worship the mind to the exclusion of the mind of the Lord, right? And the scripture says we have the mind of Christ, but we, we limit it to certain things, and we don't believe that if he's in us, he should be speaking through us. He should be showing us things, right? We believe it, but only to a certain point. We don't trust it. We actually don't trust the mind of the Lord in us. We don't actually trust the Holy Spirit. In the early church, most of what they did was entrust the Holy Spirit. Does it make sense? For instance, Jesus is our, is, is our leader. He is our example. He still is. Right now, he's operating in the world today. But let's look at what Jesus did. <clears throat> you have this... You have. A situation where the woman at the well, the Sumerian woman, Marian woman, who's at Jacob's well, is what I remember. Jesus goes to her and says, I want a drink of water. And she says, why is it that you or a Jew are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? A lot of times, as we enter into things, the Holy Spirit will start speaking. Right here, we see a word of knowledge. <clears throat> Jesus responds to her and says, he knows that the Lord is moving in this. His Father is moving. He says, if you knew who it was who was asking you for a drink of water, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. So he's starting to, to interact with this lady because he knows God is moving, and he's listening to what the Holy Spirit's saying, and he's seeing the Father move here, and he's seeing something. And he says, you know, she says, well, give me this water. And the conversation goes on, but then he says... Um, bring the show. Why don't you bring your husband or something like that? Or she says something like that. In other, and then he responds back, and she says, "I don't have a husband." And he responds back. He says, "You're correct in saying this, for you have like five husbands, and the one you're with today is not even your brother, your husband." How did he know that? People will say, "Well, that's just God knowing that." But if Jesus came as fully man and fully God to show us what it looked like and he says do the works that I do you if you follow me you will do the works I do in greater works then he's only showing us what can be done by allowing the Holy Spirit to inhabit us and being surrendered to him so what you see there is a word of knowledge the Holy Spirit speaking to the Lord and saying this woman has five husbands the one she's with today is not even the husband the moment she heard that she knew that God was seeing her and she immediately believed that he was Messiah. And she went back to the villages after this conversation and said, I found him whom the prophets have spoken about. And you see revival happening in Samaria through this one word of knowledge with the Lord Jesus. Um, it would be a lot for people today. I think that once you experience it, something like that happened. And that kind of thing happens for me regularly, like daily. That kind of thing happens. At first, it's really... You have to be un you have to untrain everything you think you you know, <laughs> and understand that you just don't know a whole lot, and that God knows all things. And I think that it requires a level of trust and intimacy to believe that the Lord would actually inhabit us and speak to us for the, for the sake of the world, and the sake of the body of Christ. But the moment you start walking in that, and you recognize this is actually very natural for a son and daughter of the Most High, which is what we are once we we're adopted by Him once we believe in Jesus, this is actually normal. This is how things should be. Because this is how he walked. And this is how the New Testament church walked. And we're in the New Testament church. But it re it's a releasing of control. A lot of times, it's like, people have a hard time with it because they don't want to walk in those waters. They want to be in control. Um, that's the best I can say about it. 
But once you start to walk in there and then you see the works of God have never stopped and you actually experience the love of God and the restoration, you, there's no turning back. You're like, suddenly your heart finds a home. Oh, everything you've ever said is true. You're exactly the same. It actually causes you to say, God, you have never changed. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You are immutable. You're omniscient. You're omnipresent. You are holy. You never change. Your promises are good. That's what it causes you to do. It causes you to actually walk in love and fear of God and holiness. It, it actually draws you into those things and draws the world who don't see him into those things. I've seen this. Um, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> when I'm just in public and I see this happen, one of the things I've come to find out is that there's a lot more resistance to the God being present in the church than there is in the world. <laughs> I actually believe that we are created in the image of God. We are hardwired to hear his voice. And that I've come to believe that people who aren't believers have an internal hardwiring to know that two things are true. Number one, that if there is a God, he is all powerful. And number two, he is love and that he can actually do things and that he loves me. Like, even though they don't know it, they believe that if there is a God, he should be good and he should be all powerful. He can do things. I've seen it over and over again because this happens to me all the time with people who are believers and they respond so naturally where people in the church are like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but people who don't know him, they're like, this is, they know that, that God is, suddenly they know that God is present and they will completely get their lives over because they've just had an experience that matches this internal faith. See, so scripture says every man has given a gift of faith, meaning every man or woman has a gift of faith it can be little it can be huge everyone has this seed inside of them to receive God everybody does and God wants to touch that and grow that so that they will receive the Messiah receive the King of Kings everyone has it I've seen it I've seen it um, so much of the times evangelism is really about touching that seed allowing the Lord through you to touch that seed it's really a work of God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And you see this in the great revivalists throughout history. You see it in D.L. Moody and Charles Finney. D.L. Moody was preaching all the time. It wasn't until two little old ladies, this is in the 1800s during the Second Great Awakening. Two little old ladies were praying in his church saying, Pastor, we're praying for you that you would receive the bass of the Holy Spirit. And one day he received something. And then after that moment, people started coming to the Lord in droves. He wasn't doing anything different. The only difference was that suddenly something happened where the Holy Spirit baptized them. Jesus baptized him in the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly, power from on high came on him, and it opened people's ears so that that seed inside of them suddenly began to see the Lord Jesus. And that's the big difference. I think that's what we're lacking. We're lacking cooperating with the Lord and surrendering to the Lord. And it, it takes a trust walk, but once you start to do it, it's just like, one thing it does is it removes all fear off of you. The fear of fear, you just lose a sense of fear. And it, you, you are motivated by love to step out in love, and it moves the impossibility off of you. It, it makes it so that you know God is going to do something. You know God will free people. You know God will heal people. You know God will completely do, he can do anything. And that, that Jesus really is king, and he's working right now. 